I'm Lynn Manuel Miranda, and you're listening to Hard Knock Life. Welcome to the podcast. I am so excited to have a special guest joining us this week. We, we were talking about House of Ninjas on the podcast recently, so who better to have join than the creator, writer, director of Netflix's House of Ninjas, Dave Boyle. Welcome to Hard Knock Life. Hello. Thanks for having me. You know, it, you, we've kind of like circled each other because we have a lot of mutual friends, but you know, I've been a big fan for a long time. Not only did you create House of Ninjas, you're responsible for the Go Nakamura Cinematic Universe. <laughs> and, and you know... The GNCU. Uh, the G- yeah. the GC, GNCU, I guess is what we'll call it. It's nothing to do with vitamins, though. But um, <laughs> but no, so welcome to the podcast. We're, we're, we're big fans here at the Nerds of Color. Oh, thanks. No, no, it's it's great to be on. I, I'm uh, uh, The feeling's mutual, so I'm very glad to be here. And thanks for checking out House of Ninjas. Yeah, absolutely. So let's just dive right into because like, you know, we, we were talking about movies like Daylight Savings and and White on Rice and Surrogate Valentine. Like these were all very like indie films, you know, did the, 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 the Asian American Film Festival circuit. How did you go from that to like one of the biggest, you know, shows on Netflix? And not only was it, you know, number one, I think globally a couple weeks ago, but like, you know, it was, it was kind of this like big budget, big, you know, high, high uh, concept netflix show um you know just i well i can't get into specifics it might not be as big budget as everybody's thinking <laughs> well you make it look big budget i'll just put it <laughs> just that, throwing one. that out there um well you know it it's funny it, all all those all the indie films that i was making i never i i just always was uh it never occurred to me that i was doing anything uncommercial I was always trying to make big hits <laughs> and then and somehow, you know, black and white movies about, you know, a guy on the road with his guitar. It was it was puzzling to me how that wasn't, you know, setting the box office on fire. So I just I, I think I just sort of had a funny kind of uh, perspective on it that, you know, um, that filmmakers tend to get because you get you get excited about something and then you think, well, if I'm excited about it, then the whole world is going to be excited about it. <laughs> Um, so, you know, those, those, I wasn't really making films. I, I was making movies, but with, a with very little money, you know, mm-hmm. and I, and I was always trying to make something that was entertaining and, um, you know, really swung for the fences and stuff. And I, I think that, you know, the way that House of Ninjas came about was sort of a direct, uh, result of the last movie I made, um, which was Man from Reno. And I think that Man from Reno was the first movie I made that, you know, at least connected sort of a, a little bit wider than my previous movies. And also, you know, someone that kind of, I, I was able to move to LA after that and got representation and kind of started, <clears throat> started working as more of like a working professional instead of somebody who's just, you know, as, uh, aspiring to do it. Um, Cause the, the, one of my producers on Man from Reno, um, my friend uh, Taro Goto. Uh, after that, he he moved on and joined Netflix as a as a Netflix employee, and you know we kept in touch kind of over the years. And then just one day out of the blue, um, you know he he uh, called me up and he's like, "Hey, are you interested in ninja stuff?" <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, who doesn't who doesn't love." who doesn't love ninja stuff you know um what do you what do you got kind of thing um you know in in the in the years in between he had been kind of tracking what I've been doing because I you know I I was working as kind of a jobbing writer and I had sold some pitches and you know worked on various things that it kind of for the most part stalled out in development one at one stage or another so I was in this in this phase of just trying to get that that next big break and I didn't I didn't want to do the I didn't want to do another indie where you're sort of you know cobbling together finance from a million different different places so I was in a place where I just was trying all kinds of things and um so originally what it what it kind of came down to is you know he said that Kento Kaku the star of the the show had had brought 
this idea to Netflix, they were sort of looking for um, people to kind of pitch their take on it kind of thing. Um, so it's sort of an OWA, open writing assignment type of situation. But um, but I, you know, I talked to them and I got the job to just do the, to just write the show Bible. And that was, you know, and that was originally kind of supposed to be pretty much the end of it. Like <laughs> the, I, I would do that and then they would take it from there. Um, but Kento was really happy with it and, you know, sort of momentum built to have me involved a little bit more. And so I was like, well, maybe we'll have you write an episode. We'll have you write the pilot or something like that. And, and then, I don't know, so slowly but surely, it wasn't something that happened all at once. But, you know, over the course of a, a year and a half or so, I went from just kind of helping out to sort of being at the center of this center of this thing. Yeah, and you have the write, writer, director, creator credit. And I think you, Kento is a co-creator because it was his story idea that you ended yeah, up Yeah, Kento, um, he has the based on the original uh, idea by. So it's Kento and then Yoshiaki Murao and then one more one more fellow named Imai who's in the in the cast. He plays the BNM guy who never talks, mm -hmm. who's always investigating the manga <laughs> and everything. So the three of them, like during COVID, you know, the working out sort of an idea for a modern ninja show was kind of the project that they were doing over zoom while everybody was in lockdown and um and you know and they they had sort of settled on the core concept of of um you know a ninja family that had kind of passed down the tradition but they you know they needed they needed more to kind of build on and and so that was that was where i came in yeah absolutely i mean when dominic and i were talking about the show we we you know what i what i was kind of like giddy about is that it, it does have like kind of like incredibles fantastic four superhero kind of vibes because it is a family of heroes who are like reluctant to get back well some of them are more reluctant than others to get back into the game and and you know they have like their own like commissioner gordon type who you know sends out the bat signal and, and gets them gets them in, involved and it does have like that kind of like superhero sense but i don't know if you're a superhero guy or not but i wondered like you know, I, I openly wondered like how much you know influence you had in terms of like bringing those kind of sensibilities to to the show. Yeah, I think um, I I think you know the overall sort of tone and the the kind of I guess the worldview of the show, like the setup and how um, you know who they work for and all that, all all that stuff was were, was was uh, kind of my my contribution. You know, get, getting getting kind of that. The world of the show i guess so to speak i think the thing that you know because because i did want it to have sort of that um you know the pleasure that you have from the superhero type of stories where you're kind of watching the heroes kind of uh embrace their destiny and mm -hmm. you know and, and uh, old enemies emerging and all that kind of stuff and kind of you know learning a little bit about the world as you go along what i what i was really eager to avoid was was anything supernatural and anything ov overly techie because mm -hmm. i i felt like um you know the world of ninjas is is just so it's so fun when it's very very analog yeah and i get i get sort of um you know you know i don't i don't know i tend to sort of shut down when things are too like gadgety and stuff where I, I so i don't know so my my idea with that was was to to try to make it you know present shinobi as more of an identity than, yeah. than anything else so it's it's something that they cling to it's it's traditions that they're stubbornly holding on to you know that they don't you know they use smartphones but they don't like doing it that, that kind of thing. <laughs> no and i then, love, I love how he uses his ninja skills to fill vending machines that's like that was a that was one of my, one of my favorite touches so like, you know, if, if someone is going into this is, and is familiar with like, you know, you, like your more indie film background, they may not, you know, go in expecting like some like high quality martial arts stunts. How did, how did you like direct those scenes and how, like, what did you draw on? You know, you, 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 you were, is this new, was it new for you to like do a lot of the action stuff, a lot of like, I guess the stunt work and the wire work that was involved? I mean, at that scale, for sure. I'd done a little bit, like even, you know, White on Rice had like a car crash in it. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, so did, so did Man from Reno. And then I did, you know, I did one TV guest directing stint where there, were, you know, there was some action in it. That, so I kind of learned a little bit over the years, but nothing 
on on this scale. So I, I think that, you know, um you got I mean, whole I, armies of ninjas fighting each other and, and stuff. Yeah, like. yeah, but but I also had whole armies of people helping me. Yeah. You know, I had I mean I had eight assistant directors and uh and also I had a whole action department that was in charge of making sure that that stuff was ready to go and everything. And I had a really wonderful action choreographer named uh, Keia Tabuchi, um, who was involved from a, a fairly early stage, you know, like even when, when we were still writing the scripts, so that we could um, talk to him about, you know, the kinds of weapons that, that we wanted to have involved, the kind of, you know, just consent. I, I, I think that like, what I learned, or, or what I thought I knew going into it and and was sort of confirmed by the experience that I had was it it's important to go into it as as a director having a really really strong sort of conceptual uh foundation to work from for any for any sort of action scenes and everything and then the specifics you know I I felt like I really had to rely on the team to you know to sort of help help kind of get get it where it needed to be and you know my my job was to kind of be the primary the first audience and member in in making sure it was delivering the emotions that it, it needed to deliver and that you know and that the acting that the basically the characters had room to breathe that the action was you know consistent with the characters all that kind of thing so there's some you know there's some um action scenes in the in the show like for example in episode one when he when he fights the guy at the club like mm -hmm. I, I i storyboarded every shot of that and then there were other scenes where you know it's, i um you know where tabuchi san and his team would kind of do the choreography show it to me and then we you know they would make like a video demo to to kind of show off how it could potentially be mm -hmm um you know blocked for the for the location and everything and then there'd be a notes process um so it, it all was you know it, it kind of varied especially since there was so much of it every, every you know every episode had some you know at least a handful of big action scenes and then so there are times when when I would get really really specific and granular about what I was trying to what I was trying to do and then other times when I would kind of Oh, let the you know let tabuchi san at least have the first crack at it and then so it was a great collaboration in that way um yeah i think you know you just you just have to sort of have a good sense of humor about it and be open about it and um you know ultimately the the other thing is, is that i also was just very fortunate in the the team that i had around me because everybody really really wanted to um they really really wanted to accomplish well the the same thing you know everybody was trying to make the same show and it's not always like that so that's that's a uh, that's that was a, a huge plus so how how involved were you with the casting because I, I don't know how much american audiences realize when they're watching the show but like the cast in japan is stacked like you have yeah. you know uh, it, it, kento kaku of course was co co-creator of the show but you know my wife, my wife was Japanese when she was watching it, and like she, she psyched, she was psyched about Eguchi Yosuke because like, you know, he, he plays the dad in this, but if you're not familiar, he was like, a you know, a heartthrob pop idol back in the 80s and 90s. So like, it was, it was just interesting to see him playing like a, a dad character, but Kimura Tei and um, the naked director, Yamada Takayuki, you, like how did, were you involved in, in, in directly in getting like such a amazing cast together or? Was yeah that, they um, already signed up when you joined no nobody was signed up when i joined uh you know the the original the bible that i wrote was sort of because the the other thing is the, the system in japan is is a lot different than here i mean you know here you might get some sort of a loose attachment or something based on you know the strength of like for example an ip you know like well we're we're uh we're making the next batman movie you know and you can you can cast based on the strength of just we're, we're making the next batman movie in japan a lot of especially tv projects it's a little different for film um you know actors are sort of slotted into shows and movies so far in advance and oftentimes they're shooting two or three things at once 
um, they're usually cast off of basically like a project proposal, you know? So like, and um, so once we had the Bible that I wrote in hand, then the casting process began. And I was, I was involved in, um, I was involved in that. And then a lot of it also came down to the, you know, the producers at Netflix and Toho and who they had personal connections with and could recommend for the, for the roles. Um, but, you know, Kento obviously was, was, uh, w was sort of the, the main building block in there. And then, um, you know, building, kind of getting the family all kind of built in was, was the first task. And, um, Tai, Tai Kimura is, is somebody that I've wanted to work with for a long time. Um, so I saw one of her movies at a film festival mm. like long, long ago and just always thought she was really wonderful. Um, Aju, who plays Nagi, the little sister, she was a she was a suggestion from Kento, and and she's also kind of got more of an art house pedigree. Like yeah. she's in, she's been sort of a protege of Koreeda for for the last few years. And then, um, you know, Eguchi san is obvious. Obviously, he's been you know he's been famous for more of his life than he's been not famous. <laughs> been around for a long time, but he he I, you know he hasn't really done that many of sort of like the dad type of character right. so um so we felt like that was you know he would have like the right combination of like seriousness but also being able to kind of play with his own image a little bit especially in the first half of the story when he's when he's resisting the call to, right. to <laughs> back into action and everything um and then you know i think for me like the biggest the the one that was uh with the 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 I think uh, Miyamoto Nobuko who plays Taki, the grandma, was, mm. was sort of the biggest, um, you know, I really wanted to get her. <laughs> and she was also, so that was something where where Kento and I just coincidentally had the same sort of notion of of roping her in for, for this. Because she's, you know, she is semi-retired and right. pretty choosy about her, her roles and and she's a legend in in, in Japan just because of Tom Popo and a lot of the, the movies that she made with uh, her husband Juzo Itami, and you know, I it it took there you know I I wrote a letter and everything and <laughs> it, it took sort of a, a lot of sort of behind the scenes kind of thing to you know to finally kind of get her to take a meeting with me and then so I was super nervous going into that. Um, but then she was, you know, she was fully on board and just wonderful to work with. Um, and then, you know, Yamada Takayuki was somebody who uh, that that was, you know, I mean, he has that relationship going back a long, a long ways with Netflix, mm. just because he was sort of the, a big part of one of their flagship <laughs> shows. Um, so that was sort of Netflix kind of taking the wheel and and uh and asking him to to do that role and and uh and luckily he you know he loved the the bible so he, he signed on to do it what's the reception been in japan because i like i said the I think it, when it debuted in february after a couple of weeks it was like number one globally um uh, you know and as you said japan has its own kind of like tv broadcast uh culture of, of of shows and things like you know tbs which are a lot of the shows are on netflix or from tbs it's probably like the main driver of a lot of a tv tokyo um, um and you have like nhk dramas and things like that but like netflix dramas there aren't a lot of them that are like produced by japanese studios how how has the reception been for house of ninjas in japan the reception has been um we and and I feel weird saying this myself, but it has been weirdly ecstatic. Like there, <laughs> it has been just a flood of articles for weeks. You know, sort of people analyzing, um, why it, you know, why it works, why it's you know connecting with people. Um, it spurred a lot of, it spurred a lot of debate. It spurred a lot of you know analysis. Um and. You know, Netflix is is sort of uh, because of just kind of streaming is is seen as still sort of an outlier in Japan. Mm. Like broad, broadcast is still much much stronger, and as a result, you know, Netflix shows are are largely kind of barred from you know any sort of free advertising on on these 
channels you know it's right, like, right, right. like this is like the equivalent here is like you know it, it'd be sort of like if the star of a netflix show in the u.s can't just go on colbert to, to talk right. about the show. same kind of thing but and that's a managed, big deal in japan like the variety shows and the talk shows where like a lot of celebrities kind of go on and promote things is a big part that's of how you that's how you get people to watch stuff like the celebrity culture there is just extremely strong and so it did have it did have a really strong start and a lot of people sort of talking about and and people sort of within the industry especially have really take you know sat up and taken notice um just because it 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 feels it does a lot of things that i I think are sort of um unusual for a japanese drama and and so it's it's caught a lot of attention that way and then one thing that really sort of (laughs) sent it into overdrive was just when Shohei Otani did an interview a couple of weeks ago where he just mentioned that he and his wife were watching the show and then just (laughs) him mentioning that he was watching it suddenly like sent the you know yeah um sent things into orbit again and so hopefully uh, nobody placed any bets on house of ninjas those (laughs) (laughs) is it too soon sorry (laughs) (laughs) um no, I hey, I was I was as surprised by that scandal as anybody. But anyway, no, I I think that what what the other the other like big deal about you know House of Ninjas is that I think you know compared to a lot of, and you know you, you kind of like talk mentioned it earlier compared to a lot of like the, at least the Japanese shows that are on Netflix the, the ones that are kind of imported from the broadcast channels like the production value of House of Ninjas even if you're not you know playing with a big budget. I, looks like it's a big budget show like the the sets the production value as i said like how how instrumental were you in making sure that it looked as great as it did i mean that coming in as the director of the series um you know i mean it's it's one of those things where you you sort of set the parameters of what kind of world the show is set in and everything i mean it's weird i i was always pushing to make things more ordinary <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, just because I, I felt like it was important that the the show takes place like in a very very normal you know recognizable modern day Tokyo so um, and, and also that you know that the kind of the ninja world is sort of right underneath the surface of the real world so um, you know but I, I think, you know, the credit for the production value and, and, and like how great it looks really goes to all the, the you know, the department heads and the, the crew members. I mean, we had a, it was just like a murderer's row of just great, you know, crew members, veteran, um, like you know, Yuji Hayashida, who was the production designer, um, you know, he's a veteran, he's sort of, he's a you know Mike's regular production designer and just a crazy imaginative wonderful uh designer and then my you know our our a lot of our camera and lighting crew was out of Kyoto um uh you know my dp was a veteran guy named Shoji Ebara who's who's uh you know kind of a specialist in shooting um jidai geki you know like period pieces samurai samurai films and and things like that and uh and just really has kind of a a wonderful uh light touch about his about his style and everything and um and you know all all, every everybody i'm trying to think you know kumiko ogawa who was the costume designer like she did the costume for kill bill and it's just sort of a, a legend in her own right so it really was kind of um you know a dream come true it'd be sort of like if a if an unknown japanese director came to the u.s and did like a show that was shot you know that was made by straight academy award winners <laughs> down the line, you know, and, the, and the crew um so it's it's you know i i felt like my role was as steward of the story and kind of guardian of the guardian of the tone of the show and, and you know making sure that the story was well told um, there wasn't a whole lot of need for quality control on my part. <laughs> I'll, put it, I'll put it that way. <laughs> so, I mean, one of the things that's been, you know, kind of like striking about your career, both in America and now in Japan, is that you've been such a champion and friend to like Asian Americans. Like your your entire filmography, you know, 
centers stories and narratives of, of Asian American protagonists. Like I said, the Go Nakamura cinematic universe is a direct, you know, result of, of the work that you've done. And now, you know, doing this show as a Westerner in Japan, how, how has that, like, why, why did you choose to go down that path and be such a champion of the Asian and Asian American narrative? You know, I, I <laughs> is it, we're just coincidence. That yeah, happened. you know, I I feel like it's going. It's it's funny. I I you know I I always um. It's it's very nice of you to call me a champion, but I I always felt like, you know, <laughs> most of everything I've done is out of, <laughs> out of just uh, just kind of I I don't I'm trying to think of, you know, it's 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 one of those things where uh, I think I I figured out early on that, um you know, that, that a career is something that you, that you can't really plan, especially if you're coming into sort of film and, and TV as, as like a total outsider, you know, you don't have not, you don't have any connections or anything. Um, and so, you know, the, the kind of roundabout way that, that it sort of happened was that, you know, I, I originally learned to speak Japanese as a, as a Mormon missionary in Australia, which was its own sort of kind of weird coincidence that kind of took my life into this mm -hmm. little bit of a left turn and then you know when I when I sort of had the opportunity to make my first movie um that was a couple years after that and it was sort of a heavily disguised version of that experience of you know this goofy white guy trying to learn to speak Japanese um and you know the 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 movie is is what it is but I think that the thing that that movie sort of um did for me was that I just was I just suddenly met this talent pool of of people in LA because I, I wasn't living in LA at the time but I would just go you know for auditions and stuff I suddenly just met all these you know these great talented actors and at the time you know things were different than they were now there were very very few movies that had sort of um Asian or Asian American uh kind of lead uh lead roles besides you, you know indie movies mm -hmm. um and then it, it was kind of it was kind of those collab it, it just sparked these collaborations you know going going and then um i mean even go nakamura like he's still you know he's still one of my best friends he's somebody that we we talk to uh, that i talk to almost, almost every day but you know the, the way that that whole thing started was i was at a film festival and I was just walking around, I think the, the Peace Plaza in San Francisco um, and just waiting for a screen or something. And I just heard somebody singing <laughs> and I just uh, really liked what I was hearing and sort of, you know, the crowd parted and, was like, <laughs> and the, the person who was singing with, you know, with his PA system all set up was go. And we just became, we just became fast friends, you know, because we were kind of on the road trying to do the same thing you know we're both just trying to make some make stuff that was meaningful to ourselves and and get it out there and and then you know the movie that I was sort of out tub thumping for at that time didn't work financially and I was sort of in a in a bind I was trying to figure out sort of my next thing and so it just became this move of like hey go like let's make a movie <laughs> and then and then before we knew it you know we had made a couple movies together and and so it's it's one of those things where i i <clears throat> i don't feel like there's ever been sort of this grand design to it and um you know like like most i i also the other thing that i sort of figured out early early on in my in in trying to make movies and and make stuff is just that it's it's really a casino out there in terms of what gets made and then what what gets made is also you know there's this extra layer of what gets out there and gets seen and so the more sort of chips you have on the table the the better off you are so i'm always developing i'm always writing you know lots and lots of different things and and um and it's just been this crazy coincidence that for me the only things that have kind of gotten through the end of, have, <laughs> have been the you know the filmography that it is and and so so i don't I think what makes it so meaningful though is that, as you said like the times like you know white on rice came out in 2009 that was before asians were seen on screen like the only times we would see basically the only times you would see an asian american on screen 
it was at a Dave Boyle movie, right? Because no, right, Hollywood right. wasn't casting. Well, let me, <laughs> this, this was a pre Crazy Rich Asians world, is what I'm saying, right? Like the, I mean, I'm, I'm being a little like exaggerating, but you know, but the indie, as you said, the indie film world, we weren't used to seeing Asian Americans on screen. Now we've kind of like broken through, and you're seeing a lot more Asians. Not still not nearly enough that we can't. It's, it's not like okay, we can stop now, right? Like there's still always room for plenitude right we're always talking about plenitude and and not scarcity and, and i think we're, we're slowly but surely getting into that space and i think i mean you know you, you're, you're more humble than you should be that a lot of the films that you did the, the people that you put in these films like james kyson lee lynn chen perry shen they they're all like you know important people in the in, in the uh firmament of asian america sentiment you know and and i think that's that's all due to a lot of the work that you put into it even if it was coincidental or not <laughs> No, I mean, I mean, in my mind, I was just lucky that they were, you know, that they were um, happy to to work with me on these. You know, it was I, I had a great time. It was, you know, there was never a lot of money going around on those movies, but um, but it was it was sort of, you know, I, I was trying to figure out my artistic voice and sort of my kind of, you know, life stuff and everything and. It's funny watching those movies now. Uh, a, a lot of them, just because just I just see somebody you know in their twenties just trying desperately to figure things out and <laughs> <laughs> uh, life wise and film wise and everything. Yeah. But um, but they you know everybody was everybody was so cool. Um, and uh, you know and and you know a lot of a lot of great memories making those movies for yeah. sure. I have to. I mean, full disclosure. I thought you were Asian American. I was like, he must be like mixed or something, right? Because he like he gets he gets our stories so well. He's got to have some Asian in him. But um, no, no, all all that is really down to my my collaborators. Yeah, you know? I mean, I mean, go like go was a was a co writer on those on right. those movies with me, and and so, um, you know, I I I think it's it's yeah yeah. No, I well, and you know, I I think it's it's just it. It's a testament to like, you know, there there is always the eternal debate about who can tell whose stories. And I think, and you know, Dominic and I were talking about it. I think it just depends on, you know, it the word words like authenticity can kind of get like thrown around too like, you know, too easily. But I think it's just about, you know, whenever you tell any kind of story, it's about are you getting to the emotional truth of whatever it is you're trying to tell? And it doesn't really matter who's telling those stories as long as you're getting to those truths. Right. And I think yeah. that's what, yeah. what tends to happen when like a white person tells an Asian story is that they're just telling like very tropey stereotypical stories. And of course that that's not like, I think a great example, you know, like if we look at Shogun from like the eighties versus Shogun today, of course there's to your point, there's more collaboration between like the, the, the white creators and the, and the Asian creators too. And I think that's, that's where a lot of that comes from too. It's not just about like, you know, putting people in boxes and what they can and can't tell. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's also, I I think a lot of it is it also can can also come come down to just what the story what the story is what the type of story is and and uh you know and as a as a filmmaker if you feel like you you know I don't know I'm a big believer in like trying to find like the the song that you can that only you can sing um. And uh, and that plays that plays a part in it, you know. I think that I feel okay about doing something that's a genre show that's about um, about ninja stuff. Um, there there are other you know Japanese stories, other Asian American stories where I don't feel I, I would be like the, mm. the right person to tell that. Where I feel like it would have to come from you know a more a voice that has that has lived something along those lines i mean you know my my sort of way into this whole because like you never when when something is like a writing assignment you know you never have that much time to to sort of really delve into it like deadlines are always just really 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 tight <laughs> and so i i find that i always have to find some sort of personal way into a story no matter what it is um and on this one you know i just like my research into uh shinobi lore and everything the thing that i really latched onto was were all of the rules and and regulations that they had to live by whether it was like not drinking alcohol or not having sex or not you know not eating meat and all all those things and it's I just very jedi like, yeah it's very it's very jedi and it's also and it's also very mormon yeah <laughs> so oh true like, yeah 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 
So I was like, oh, you know, I can totally like I just thought of them in, in a way like as a fan as a family of Mormons. They, <laughs> they, all, they all are sort of all over the place in terms of how they how they feel about it, how they feel about it. But um, you know, in, in terms of it's it's a piece of it's a piece of fiction, it's a piece of pulp, but I felt like there was some sort of, you know, emotional core to it the the family that i wanted to latch on to to be able to write it and that was sort of my way to sort of imagine you know to, to be like okay you know if you if you are living by a set of values that are very very different from you know kind of the the folks around you then that's you know that's something that i grew up with and understand and felt like i i could write yeah I mean, absolutely the, the, you know I, I i actually tell people when they when going into the show like the family dynamics is is more impressive if, than even the like the the ninja stuff like you know you, you kind of think you know it's just a bunch of karate and stuff but no it's like the the way that the the family is is it was my favorite part and and all of like the relationships was and you know i know that uh dominic asked if you were a gi joe guy and you said you weren't really a gi joe guy which was sad me because i was thinking as i was watching the show like i wish you did the snake eyes movie <laughs> instead of the one we got but i guess you know i still haven't seen the snake eyes movie yeah you, yeah, you don't I, need I, to <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but, but it would it would be great if Dave Boyle does the the Snake Eyes movie instead. But <laughs> it, since you you won't be doing a Snake Eyes movie, can you tell if there are plans for more seasons? Because it does end in such a way that could p- potentially lead into more stories. Is there is there a season two of House of Ninjas brewing, or is that something you can talk about? Yeah, you know, I I think all I'm uh, really allowed to say is that you know that just it's it's up to netflix um we we did we do have a lot more planned and banked you know i i did i did write more than one season's worth of story for it and uh and there's a lot that we want to do and and kento and i um you know want to do it uh so it 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 uh but you know there's a there's a process any any sort of big studio thing is 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 kind of a a process and also you know um there's also just a lot of people's schedules and and everything to to sort of to getting getting this group of people back together (laughs) (laughs) so a, a group of extremely busy actors um but you know the conversations are ongoing and when when they're ready then they'll then they'll pull the trigger so well, I'm sure one thing that will help is if people keep streaming House of Ninjas on Netflix. Uh, and and if you if you watch the whole show, go back and watch it again. I don't know how Netflix determines numbers. I don't think anyone knows. I think it's this like you know, locked uh, process locked in a box somewhere that no one no one has. It's like the you know KFC secret secret <laughs> recipe. No one knows what goes into the algorithms that they determine to what makes a hit or not. But I think keep streaming house of ninjas and, and perhaps that'll convince netflix to give us more seasons yeah no I'd, I'd i'd love to i mean i'm you know i'm i'm working on other stuff and and uh and but this this is a show that i really really love and would would come back to in a in a heartbeat i think that you know i hope it 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 is we i'm trying to think of how to put this you know there there is the last episode of the show is my favorite one because I, I feel like all the, you know, all the, the kind of the red herrings and everything else sort mm. of finally melt away and everything and everything, hopefully, at least in my own mind, makes sense. And the, the, the purpose of the story, you know, takes on a, a whole new, a whole new meaning. Um, and so, you know, in my own mind, it, 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 it does work as a self-contained yeah. series in a way, but, but, you know, it's also setting up things to, to go in a whole new wild direction. So, so I do, I do hope people will check it out and watch it all the way through the end and, you know, and uh, see what, see what you make of that ending. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it, it's, you're right. It does. You, you know, if it, if we only ever get one season of house ninjas, it's definitely worth your while to watch it in its completion because it does tell a great story a, a complete story because i think sometimes when when we think of these you know uh tv series and and how the things end on cliffhangers or whatever like some people do feel like if it, if it never gets renewed i'm going to feel cheated it does tell a complete story but th- it also lends itself to telling more stories 
if you're given that opportunity that's what that's what's great about about season one of house of ninjas um they, I, I have been yeah i do get criticized for being like a half gl- uh, glass half empty guy or sounding a little <laughs> so i want to i want to re- like it has been it has been a hit for them so they like they're they're happy um, I mean, it's always at the top of my Netflix thing whenever I log in. So, like, and I've watched it. It keeps telling me to watch it again. So, I mean, I'm assuming it's it's still it's still uh, uh, making making noise somewhere on uh, on those internet streets. Dave, thanks yeah. for thanks for joining. Um, before we before we wrap up, how can people find out what you got going on? What do you have going on? And and can they find you on the internet somehow? Um, I'm sort of. I'm a semi lurker on Twitter or <laughs> X or whatever it's called these days. Um, but you know, uh, I'm working on, I'm writing new stuff, nothing that I can really talk about yet, but, uh, you know, just kind of doing my thing. And then I'm still, you know, house of ninjas was sort of a three year sprint. And, uh, so I'm kind of, taking a little bit of time to recover from that and kind of gather myself before the next adventure but um yeah i'm around all right well i appreciate you coming on and joining us hopefully when season two gets announced you'll come back and talk to us some more anytime anytime yeah (laughs) thanks for having (laughs) me (laughs) thanks so much thanks to dave boyle you can catch me on twitter at the real chow the underscore real underscore chow and on Instagram at Real Keith Chow. Follow the Nerds of Color at the Nerds of Color on all platforms. And go to hardknockmedia.com to subscribe to the podcast. Watch our videos on youtube.com slash the nerds of color. And that's it. I'm riding solo today. Dominic will be back next week. Until next time, I will say Ghostbusters Frozen Empire was actually a really good movie. I enjoyed it quite a lot. Hopefully, I'll talk about it some more next week. But all the negative reviews are stupid, and you should go out and see Ghostbusters. So, with that, Busted makes me feel good. This is the hard knock life, but not the chicken kind. More like the people.